Amen. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. Just an interesting week we had with uh, 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 Rick Johnson's homecoming and the joy of knowing that he fully surrendered to Jesus a few years ago and celebrated his, his entering into eternity. And then uh, Hannah Friend, now Hannah, I, boy, I don't, the last name. Vandruff. See, there's no way I was going to pull that out of the memory banks. Hannah and Boris's wedding yesterday, it was great. And both are celebrations. Well, kids, third grade and under, you're dismissed for kids' church. Kids, third grade and under. Amen. We've been in the book of 1 Corinthians, and you're welcome to turn there now. What I love about Scripture is it not only allows me to talk about things that are somewhat uncomfortable, but it gives us the authority of how to approach things in life. And there are topics and discussions that just don't normally come up in conversation sometimes. But if there's a place where we should talk about the tough things in life, shouldn't it be the body of Christ? Since God designed the world and created it the way he did, this is the place where we should be able to. And, uh, and so we're going to continue on in this study of 1 Corinthians. Uh, the title of today's message is Free to be Single. Now, I'm not a big candy person, especially hard candy. Man, for whatever reason, it takes me forever to make it through hard candy. Uh, but I do like Twix. And, and not that Twix has some exceptional taste compared to other candy, but I like how long and slender it is. And it comes in packages of two, right? So when you buy it, you feel like you're really getting something special because you're getting two. And, uh, and we can all agree, right, that, that two are better than one. Um, but the wrapping and the design for it is meant to house two. So let's say that you go to a gas station or Walmart or whatever else, and you get in the candy aisle, and you, you buy your Twix, and you open it up, and you rip it open, and lo and behold, there's only one Twix bar in there. Now, I'm not talking about you know, those little festive candies that you get this time of year, whatever else that's meant to be one. I'm talking about a Twix package. Would you be upset if in the package there was only one Twix? Yeah, you'd be like, I'm going to get my money's worth. I'm going to take this bag, get something else. Well, people aren't Twix bars. Hope you know that. Uh, but sometimes that's the perspective that we can have about single individuals whether they are lifelong singles or widows. And there seems to be some sort of expectation that everybody has a husband or wife out there that they just have not discovered. And if you aren't married, then you're just a Twix bar in a wrapping meant for two. Being single in the church is difficult, especially when you have a pastor that likes to relate his own personal experiences in his message so he talks about his wife and his kids and other things, and you just can't relate. And inadvertently, you feel lesser because that isn't your life. Not to mention that last week we talked about how marriage reflects the Trinity, right? How God looked at Adam and said, he's not good and it's not good for man to be alone. And so the, the marriage is a God-given structure here on this earth that helps us understand in a unique way, how God can be three persons and yet one, and yet in marriage, two people become one flesh. You don't lose your personhood, you don't lose your personality when you get married, and yet there's something supernatural that occurs. If you're a Christian single today and have felt these very same things and pressures, this message is for you. But don't tune out married couples because very often we're the ones guilty, many times unknowingly, of causing our single brothers and sisters in Christ to feel lesser. And so we need to be aware of the right perspective and approach to life within the body of Christ. Last week we established that as Christians made in the image of God, we always have a choice. We always have a choice. So all of us are born broken. We're all born sinful. And yet all of us have a part of us that the Methodists like to call prevenient grace or a grace that draws us to God. We're all born with a God-shaped hole. And there's a desire in us to fill that God-shaped hole. 
And so that desire that we have is God prompting us to him, and we do have a choice whether we choose him or reject him. And once you choose Jesus, guess what? You still have a choice daily. It would be wonderful for many of us to consider that if we came to Jesus and we chose him, that from that point on we become robots and then we we can't choose the bad things anymore. We can only choose good things. And Wouldn't that be great? But that's not love, right? Love demands a choice. And so daily you have choices that you can make and you have freedom to choose. It's a beautiful thing. But not everything you can choose is good for you, right? We talked about Twinkies. I don't know what it is about me, we, me and food lately. Today it's Twix. Last week it was Twinkies. But we talked about a Twinkie every once in a while not being a bad thing. But if you eat 10 Twinkies a day, uh, you're going to have uh, either a shortened lifespan or not a very good life. And um, so you, you have to consider those choices that you make. The choices that you make can either benefit your relationship with God benefit your relationship with others and also benefit you or they can hurt or harm all the above Um, sometimes even good things taken to an excess can be a bad thing and if you remember i talked about being a fan of coca-cola like if you like coca-cola products you know you can collect coca-cola branded stuff and before you know your house is filled up and you spent thousands of dollars and then you're renting a storage unit for all your coke stuff and then you don't know all that you have and before you know it you're in bondage to it right we can get that way even with good things in our life we also learned that our bodies are valuable to god god cares about your body he doesn't just care about your spirit and soul when you get saved he wants to change and redeem all of you. So we're not driven um, by our physical or sexual desires because as Christians, we don't own our bodies anymore. Christ owns our body. So we have, our, we have freedom of choice, but we don't have freedom of body. Imagine, as I used the illustration last week, that you own a home and then you sell it to somebody and they graciously let you still live in your former home that is now their home. You do not have freedom now to do what you want to in that house. You can't tear out walls. You can't redecorate. You you can't add additions or take away. You can't have whoever you want to that home, whatever, because it's not yours anymore. That is your body. Your body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we're our body, we need to take care of it. We need to, to nurture it because God cares about us as well. And so our attitude needs to get in line with our new reality in Christ. I have true freedom, but I can't use my freedom to put me back into bondage. And now, because I don't own my body, I have to do with my body what would increase my faith and draw me closer to God. And so Jesus came to redeem our spirit, our soul, our mind, and our body. Now we're jumping into chapter 7. And chapter 7 relates to human relationships. Okay, so it, it, half of it talks about singleness, half of it talks about marriage, and so we're going to spend this week and next week in chapter 7, but I'm really wanting to key in on singleness today. And I'm choosing to put singles first today because often they're put second, right? And, and so I want to, to emphasize um, where Paul is in this as he speaks about being a single as well. So we're going to look at the first two verses of chapter 7. It says, now regarding the question you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there's so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. So here we're privy to some information that we didn't have before, that this new church that Paul established in Corinth has written him a letter with specific questions about how to live their life. And so we got to remember, this is a baby church. These are early church Christians who are trying to understand what it means to follow Jesus. What about my life has changed? And if you remember, Corinth as a city was one of the largest of the ancient Roman world, and their primary place of worship was the temple of Aphrodite that was said to have a thousand temple prostitutes. And so part of their natural order of worship was to go and, and have these immoral acts with these prostitutes in hope, hopes that their goddess Aphrodite would see and be pleased and would bless their crops and, and their house and their animals and everything. That was how they worshipped. 
And so they're saying, now that you're our God, how are we to worship? How does sex fit into our lives? Paul says flat out, abstaining from sexual relations is not bad, but good. What a different perspective than the rest of the world has about sex, right? Like they say it's the be-all, end-all of everything. Every billboard, every advertisement, every TV show, it just is thrown in your face. And Paul says, yeah, you can live without it. <sighs> let's, just, let's all just take a deep breath here, right? Isn't that nice to know that that does not have to define who we are? That there is life and joy, and, and freedom that we can have outside of, of that act uh, 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 in human experience. He doesn't say it's bad or that it's evil. He just says it's good to abstain from it. But then he says, because of their society, and our society as well, is so oversaturated with sexual immorality, it's better that a person marry and have sex according to God's design within the confines of marriage between one man and woman than to fall into sin. So, this tells us that a single can overcome these urges in their life and still have a good life according to God's plan and desire. It also tells us, those that us, of us that struggle with with our, our thought patterns and, and lust and pornography and everything else, the lie that the enemy wants to tell us is this is natural to the human condition and you cannot overcome it, but by the grace and peace of Jesus Christ, as he fills up those desires in our hearts, we can abstain. Praise Jesus. So the key is that our desire to honor God's design, God and his design, is the motivating force in our life and not some physical desire or urge. You can have victory over all the damaging, painful desires in your life. Yeah, don't you like that picture? I couldn't help it after the Twinkies last week. I was like, there we go. You'll never see the Ten Commandments again the same way. <clears throat> Let's jump down uh, a few verses later, verses 7 through 9. But I wish everyone were single just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried, just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. Now, the first time I read this passage, I'm like, okay, I've got to clear the air here. Paul is not some sort of James Bond villain where his goal is that everybody remain single and then we won't have a next future generation and we're going to wipe out humanity. That's not what he's proposing here. What he's saying is he enjoys his life of singleness. He doesn't see it as a curse. In fact, he sees it as a gift. Singleness as a gift. A gift from God, not better or worse, just different from the gift of marriage that others have. Paul does not feel lesser because he's single. He's embraced this gift from God. And, and he loves being single so much, he says, I wish everyone could experience what it's like to have contentment and joy and peace in being single. I wish everybody could experience what I'm experiencing. I've had a senior saint in the church tell me um, and I, I won't mention them by name. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But, you know, they were married for so many years and then their husband passed and now they're a widow. And, uh, and I talked to them about missing being around people. And she said, oh no. She said, I don't mean to make this sound bad, but she said, I love my time, just me and Jesus. She said, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's not that I don't like people coming around, but at this stage of my life, I just love what I have being single. And that's such a beautiful thing. Um, and that's such a big part of being content, isn't it? Embracing where we are in life. So often, as, as we've talked about weeks ago, our life is driven by comparison. We see a smile on someone else's face and, and, and look at their life and say, I want to have that kind of attitude and approach. So if I had what they had, then maybe I would have joy and peace as well. And Paul is saying, no, every every type of relationship is 
a gift from God. In Paul's perspective, um, I, I believe what he's alluding to when he talks about marriage, he says, you know, if you cannot find contentment with Jesus apart from physical intimacy with another person, you should get married. Uh, and it almost sounds like, you know, hey, if you're not tough enough for a single life, you better get married. It, it sounds like he's kind of setting the standard. If you can't control these passions and these urges, then, then single life is not for you. It, it's a whole different viewpoint, right? If you're not strong enough, if you're weak, if you're struggling, get married. That's kind of how he approaches things. And so this is his opinion. So why? Why does Paul think it's better to be single? Well, let's continue on and see how he comes to this conclusion. Verses 17 through 24. Each of you should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain as you, are, as you were when God first called you. This is my rule for all the churches. For instance, a man who is circumcised before he became a believer should not try to reverse it. I don't even want to get into that. And the man who was uncircumcised when he became a believer should not be circumcised now. For it makes no difference whether or not a man has been circumcised. The important thing is to keep God's commandments. Yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave of Christ. God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. I think so many of us, if you can even remember, maybe some of you are at this place right now in your relationship with Jesus, is some of you are hesitant to give him yourself totally and completely because you're afraid that your life is going to dramatically change if you surrender to Jesus. Like, I know that if I give my life fully to God, he's going to make me be a pastor or he's going to call me to be a missionary or in a foreign land or whatever else. And, and there's some understanding there because when we read the Gospels, we see Peter and James and John and Andrew giving up their, their life of fishing we see Matthew stop being a tax collector. We see other things like that. And we think, oh, if I give my life to Jesus, it needs to change dramatically. But what Paul says here is a beautiful thing. He says, be the same as you were before you said that sinner's prayer. Before you started with Jesus, I don't think any of you should immediately radically change your life. And he uses slavery as an example, right? Like, God hates slavery, doesn't he? Doesn't, don't you think God wants slaves to stop being slaves? He does, yes. But he's saying, you're free on the inside. You know, I, I mentioned Bear and Rob who do Kairos prison ministry in our church. You know, they don't do Kairos prison ministry to start handing out keys to jail cells so that after the Kairos weekend, all these prisoners get to leave the jail. No, that's not why they do it. They, they, they don't do that in the prison. They go so that inside their heart and life, they can be free and have no longer have the chains of sin and death upon their life, even though they're still incarcerated. So the, the same is true of us. Live where God has saved you. Unless God leads you to a dramatic change, you live where you are. And so he says the same thing about singleness. He says the same thing about marriage. Don't get out of your marriages. We'll talk more about that next week. But you've got to remember that these are people who are experiencing their faith in Jesus for the first time, and they're just trying to figure out how it works practically. And I've been a Christian the majority of my life, and still, to this day, there are moments that come up where I say, God, I don't know how to handle this. Practically, I don't know how my faith works here. And so I have to go to the Word, and I have to go to, to godly counselors and, and get direction. And so that's where he's at. So there's a warning here, not to be enslaved by some sort of ideal of what a good Christian should look like or some expectation of what success in Jesus should be. The change that Jesus makes initially is always internal. He starts on the inside and then he works himself outward over time as we surrender to the Holy Spirit and his promptings in our heart and life. So what I think he's saying here in today's message is that he says, you don't have to be married 
to be a good Christian or follow Jesus. Start by remaining where you are when Jesus first called you. And if he leads you elsewhere in a different direction of life, that's a gift. But if he keeps you where you are, that's a gift. And so, I, attending the, uh, Hannah's wedding yesterday, something really stood out to me, because Pastor Dave did the service for his daughter and uh, gave a beautiful message. And, and I loved his message, because it tied right in with what Paul was going to tell us today. And, and Pastor, Pastor Dave's message was, don't expect a perfect marriage. Because if you find the perfect person, that marriage will be imperfect because you're stepping into it, right? Marriages are not two perfect people making a perfect living together. They're two imperfect people who have different ways and viewpoints and everything else trying to work together to, to, to bring something about. And so if, if you're stepping into a relationship or marriage expecting that person to fix you, you got it all wrong. In fact, the term helpmate, I think, should be more about you're to help that mate instead of them to help you. We, we can't come at it with a, a, a wrong approach. And so he is just saying, whatever you're going to do in your faith, you've got to learn to be content where you are at the beginning. And then as God leads you, accept it as a gift. Or if you stay where you're at, Accept it as a gift, okay? Let's keep reading, verses 25 through 28. Now, regarding your question about the young women who are not yet married, I do not have a command from the Lord for them, but the Lord in his mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted, and I will share it with you. Because of the present crisis, I think it is best to remain as you are. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage, and if you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do get married, it is not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it is not a sin. However, those who get married at this time will have troubles, and I'm trying to spare you those problems. Once again, a new question has been pro proposed in this previous letter, and it's, what do we do with our young women? What are they supposed to do? Are they supposed to live celibate lives? How does this work? And he tells them, and I love this, if you've never noticed this in scripture before, this is a really great and unique passage where Paul says, some things I'm going to tell you are direct commands from God for holy living, and some of them are my opinion. You know, wisdom, knowledgeable opinion, but it's not a command from God. And so here he says, this is one of those things, this is my perspective as to how you're to handle this. And his opinion is, if you're a young woman and you're not married yet, you should remain single. Because of the present crisis. Now, what present crisis were they going through? Right? I mean, we got lots of present crises going on in our life. So, looking at the original Greek, what he's saying is the pressures of life. Given the normal pressures of life, do you want to add more pressure to your life? Life is hard enough without having to add the responsibilities as husband and possibly children. When you're single, so often you can kind of look at only the, the, the good things or the, the, the pleasurable things about marriage, like, you know, falling in love and roses and candy and sunsets and blissful moments and honeymoons and sweet nothings and notes left, all those kind of things, right? You don't always consider all the extra responsibilities, like caring for that person's physical or emotional or mental needs. And the more relationships you build into your life, the more responsibility you have to share those things. So every relationship in our life comes with a commitment and a responsibility. Every single one of them. So think about your deep relationships. Even when you're single, the amount of friends that you have that you have committed yourself to comes with an added level of of responsibility. And so marriage and having children adds to those things. And he's saying, if you can avoid that and not have to deal with it, I suggest that life is hard enough. So if you don't have to add the heartache of caring for someone else or a group of individuals more, then, then you should avoid that. So every relationship comes with that. And Paul has this perspective because he's not married. And he doesn't have the same burdens or responsibilities that married couples have. Now, 
let me say this. I am not saying that singles do not have burdens and responsibilities and all the rest. Please hear me on that. I'm quoting Paul. And Paul, as a single man, is saying, I recognize that you carry burdens and responsibilities that I do not. In my just normal daily life, I'm responsible for me, and that's it. And so I'm thankful that in my life and ministry, that's all that I have. A few verses later, verses 32 through 35, he says, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or, is ne- or who has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. And so Paul is pointing out that there is a certain level of freedom that singleness provides. Singleness can make you more directly available to God without having to carry the same burdens and cares for this world that married couples and parents do. Those of you who are single and have children, you know the heaviness. It's, it's like doubly so because you don't have a helpmate to help you with children. And so it, it, it is very hard, that weight of responsibility. Either way, Paul says singleness is not a sin and marriage is not a sin. Each is a gift. But the goal is to experience fully what Jesus has designed you for, for with as little distraction as possible. So I know for me, I do better being married. As a single man, I did struggle with my thoughts and my urges and my desires. And and so being around people, having the accountability of my wife and being around others, that's just the way I'm wired. I do much better when I'm not by myself. Yes, I need those windows where I am by myself, that quiet time with Jesus or or time to, to serve and reflect. But the way that I'm wired, I'm better off as a married individual. Um, As a married man with lots of kids, I can tell you, my life is full of distractions. Sometimes I don't even know what I've stepped in until I've stepped in it. Uh, Some days are just nonstop. And so uh, there is a different way that I live than when I was just single. Um, and so you may even think that myself or Pastor Sean as pastors, you know, we're designed to, to preach God's, God's word and teach it and pray. And so you probably think as pastors, man, we have a lot of free time just to get into God's word and, and pray and all the rest. I can tell you, even just in my role as pastor alone, there's the management of the building, there's the direction of the staff, and there's the care and the concern for you. I have to make time for all those spiritual disciplines just like everybody else. Then adding in my my own personal family, it it can become heavy at times. So Paul is saying that we're not to rush or chase some better or more fulfilling life. We should go to God first and seek Him and say, Lord, what do you want from my life? I'm going to come to you at different points as your pastor and say, I see your gifting here. And I think you should be a part of this ministry. And you know what you should tell me? You can tell me no. (laughs) Or you can tell me yes. But what I want to hear first is, let me pray about it. Let me seek God's face. Let me know if, if I'm supposed to add this responsibility to my life. Or if God has something for you. See, the point of what he's saying is, I want you to live a life in Jesus that's free of unnecessary burdens. How many of you are drowning right now in your life because you've taken on burdens that you didn't consult God about first and it's weighing you down? Every gift has its advantages and disadvantages. So what gift does he have for you? Paul concludes in verse 40 with this final thought. 
But in my opinion, it would be better for her to stay single. And I'm thinking I'm giving you counsel from God's Spirit when I say this. Again, this is his opinion. And it's his only opinion. And he can only give his opinion as a single man. Right? Just as a, a married individual, you really can't see things through the lens of being single if you haven't been single, especially for a long time. But he's learned to be content with being single. When I was a single young man, I, I, I struggled with it because I always felt like, man, I, I wanted to share my time with a spouse. I, I want to have kids that I can teach the Lord's way and, and pass on the heritage that's been passed on to me. And I want to share a home with somebody and share my stuff with somebody. And now that I have it, I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you there are times I would love to just have a moment to myself or a space to myself or stuff to myself. The running joke in my, my house is, where's dad? He's in the bathroom again. The bathroom in a house full of six kids is like a fortress of solitude. You know, Superman even had to go to Antarctica to find his, right? The, the, they even bought me a toilet timer. So that I have a time limit for how long I can be there. Where's that? But it's like the one place where I'm not asked in an instant to like clean up every spill or, or solve every problem in a moment. I just, I get a moment. I get a moment. And, and so I, there are days where I miss the freedom to just pick up and go and be more spontaneous as a single. But that's not my life. And that's not my gift. And I'm responsible for those that God has entrusted with me as a provider and a protector. And yes, there are great joys with marriage and a large family. But there's also things that I miss out on because I'm not single. And so Paul is right. I'm not as available to the Lord and, and this church family as I want to, as if I were single, because I have to meet their earthly needs. And so that's my internal struggle as your pastor is I can feel this guilt and this heavy burden that I am not as available to you as I, sometimes I feel I need to be. But my challenge for me personally, reading this message and having it minister to me, is I should release the guilt that I feel because I have received the gift of a wife and six children. And so my joy should be in ministering to them and nurturing them and pouring out to them as well as to you and so there's a proper balance. How many pastor's kids end up running from Jesus because the pastor cared more for the church than his immediate family because of a wrong perspective? And so we, all of us in this room, no matter what situation you're in, need to embrace where you are as a gift from God and stop decrying what we don't have. We all, when we all look around, and we start, we start feeling bad about our condition, we, we get to a place of comparison that's not healthy. And so instead of rushing to receive what we don't have, let us all embrace the blessings that we do have. As singles, enjoy your freedom to follow Jesus and live life in a way that is not heavy with the same type of responsibilities as someone who has to care for an immediate family. And as married couples, do not forget the blessings you do have as long as you long for the freedom that you once had. Each is a gift that we need to embrace. So let's all breathe a sigh of relief, right? Embrace the season of life that God has you for. Do not feel guilty for what you're not doing or whatever expectation that you see other people placing on you. Let each of us today go to Jesus with a clear conscience and saying, God, let me receive everything that I have and everything that I am as a gift and stand up in the midst of it. And so I will tell you, churches run on single individuals who have more freedom, it seems, at times, and I'm not, again, I'm, I'm, I'm stereotyping, I don't mean to stereotype, but often from my own experience, I've seen that singles have more freedom to just jump in when there's a need. There are many singles who are prayer warriors in this church because they, they can carry the burden beyond just an immediate family, and they, and they do that. Uh, there are, are, are so many essential things 
that, that the church needs. And so we as a church, all of us need to value each other. Let, let's, not, let's not put burdens on each other. Let's not carry the weight of comparison. Let's embrace where other people are. And I apologize even for my children. You know, my children, when you grow up in a home with, with both parents, sometimes you look at a single individual. And my kids, I, especially when they were little, they'd meet somebody that they really loved, and they say, well, why aren't you married? You know? They didn't mean anything by it. They just thought, we th- So why aren't you sharing your life with someone else? Because you're so great. How can they not love you like we love you? That's what they were saying. And so let's, let's just embrace where God has us. Amen? Thank you, Jesus, for freedom in Christ. That we are not chasing some human standard of success or excellence, but in Christ when we come to you, just as we are, you change us from the inside out. And every situation in life is a gift singleness, marriage, parenthood, all different, but all beautiful and all a gift from God. And, and Lord, I know that if we take this message to its fullest extent, that even the conditions of our life are a gift as well. As Paul alluded to, slavery can sometimes be a gift. As we look at the situation in the Old Testament, where Naaman's servant, slave, Brought him, brought him when he had leprosy to Elisha and he was healed. <laughs> if it wasn't for that relationship, God, he would have never experienced your healing power. So God, even battling things such as illness or disability or even heartache can be your gift to us, Lord, so that we can grow in the knowledge of you grow in your love, and have opportunities to minister to others. And so God, today, we ask that you look at our lives, you release us from the burdens that we've been unnecessary, unnecessarily carrying, and that you show us clearly what your gifts are for our life, what your calling is for us. Please break these patterns of comparison in us, Lord. We need to love one each other, lift each other up, and embrace where every individual is. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As the lights dim down, we're going to prepare for a time of response and worship. And so our services are designed. Uh, you